We are so excited to announce that the Remedial Herstory Project will be having our first annual summer retreat coming to you in August of 2021. Join us here in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. Kick back, relax, enjoy the spa and a little bit of women's history. We are so excited to be bringing some of the best women's historians in the world to you. They are here to teach you the bits of women's history that you may have missed in history class, and we are here to guide you on the tools that you will need to get them into the classroom. The retreat is 50% pedagogy and 50% women's history. You will leave with dozens of printed lesson plans, learning materials, and tools that you can use. You can see the entire schedule of events on our website, as well as the names of some of the historians who will be presenting www.remedialherstory.com. Look for the page about the summer retreat. Come relax and enjoy the White Mountains of New Hampshire with us. Hey, Kelsey. Hey, Brooke. Want to tell everyone what's happening on today's episode? In today's episode, we are going to be talking about murder. (gasps) Yes, I love murder podcasts. And queens. And I love queens. (laughs) And this is going to be queens that are murdered. Okay, I'm in. Hello, and welcome to Remedial Her Story, The Other 50%, the podcast that explores what happened to the women in history class. Now, here's your host, Kelsey Brooke Eckert, and her partner in crime, Brooke Neva Sullivan. Murder and Queens. Today, Brooke, we are going to be talking about two badass queens from history who were murdered. And this is going to be part of a two-part series on queens um, and broadly talking about why queens in history sometimes get overlooked. Okay. In this episode, I want to talk about how, in the case of these two women, they were – well, the first one is covered up, literally covered up, and people don't know about her murder. A queen murder Cover up? Yes. And so this is just fascinating that a queen, royalty, can be can be murdered and people don't really know the details of what yeah. happened there. Okay. Um and so I think that just it actually says a lot. And this gets to one of the problematic bits of women's history mm-hmm. is the lack of historical evidence yeah. for things. Um, so and what time periods are we going back to? So today we're going to go back, we're going way back, and we're going to talk about Constantine's wife, Fausta. Oh. So Constantine, you've heard of him. You said, oh. Well, because you taught me about it once. Oh, okay. So, but for the audience, <laughs> Constantine is. He is a Roman Empire emperor, and he is um, well-known in world history. And I would imagine that if a high school history teacher taught a in epis- or taught a lesson on the Roman Empire mm-hmm. or on the Byzantine Empire, they would mention Cover. Constantine. Okay. He'd be one of the few, like, you know, in those classes, n- n- you don't get into people specifically. You get into broad so trends yeah. and, and themes in world history. And I bet he would be one of the names that is, is definitely mentioned in a history class. Um, we're also going to be talking about a queen from Sri Lanka okay. and pairing her uh, with his wife, Fausta, um, because she's really interesting. She actually uses murder herself to keep power and then is eventually murdered. And I mean, so there's a lot of murder. Like there's a little bit of asking for it if you're putting it out in the universe. <laughs> <laughs> so in the first part here, we're going to talk about Constantine and his okay. wife, Fausta. And then in the second part, we'll talk about this other queen from Sri Lanka. From Sri Lanka. Okay. okay. Awesome. So, um, Constantine the first is, uh, well known and, uh, needs to be remembered in history because he gets the Roman Empire to adopt Christianity. Mm -hmm. And it's under his reign that uh, a lot of the things that we've talked about on this podcast related to Christianity happen, like um, getting, you know, the, first of all, it to be widely accepted and, and, and as, um, one of, you know, a legitimate religion that people can be a part of to end persecution of Christians yep. in, within the empire. Um, 
And and so for that reason, um, and and actually to compile and and get sort of a sense of like what the official doctrine is, um, that all sort of occurs under it under his reign. Okay. So in a world history class, he would definitely be taught. But this episode of his life with his wife is really important. Because similar to the conversations we've been having in U.S. history about complicated historical figures, Mm -hmm. he murders his wife. Yeah, like what's the plan there? Why? And how does this change the way that we yeah he's viewed um so it's it's important to understand that like most roman emperors he is and he's sort of at this point in uh the roman history where the empire is fracturing okay. and um he why is, so is it just because it's like stretching it across is, multiple continents <laughs> actually that would be a whole e- episode in and of <laughs> itself um there's there's a, several reasons okay. and so, like most empires collapse because they are overextended so it's you know trying to militarily it's it's too difficult to defend okay. um economically it's becoming problematic and so for for a lot of reasons it's it's fracturing um and so the empire is turning into the east and the west gotcha and he's part of a brief reunification and um during that time he actually spends a lot of his time in the east which will later become the byzantine empire gotcha and um so so he while he's off doing that his wife Fausta is back in Rome. And so his I want to get into a little bit how he comes to power. Um and and a piece of that is just lots of wars and treachery okay. and um he ends up he he goes on he makes these alliances with various generals and he ends up um you know marrying Fausta she is the daughter of one of his you know enemies of sorts okay, so this sort is of bridging frenemies a- bridging a divide and uh, and most you know royal and and in this case you know and uh, most of these marriages of the elites are or always political, political yeah. right um what's the age gap in these two so for them it's uh i think it's 17 years e- or yeah 17 years so, imagine today's time a couple that is 17 years apart like you're basically marrying someone that doesn't know anything about Britney Spears <laughs> That would be so problematic for you, wouldn't it? It would be real hard. That would be really hard. We'd have nothing to talk about now. Yeah. But like, what's your common interests? Where do you build from there? Right. You just, I mean, I guess back then it was like, do you eat papaya? Do you not eat papaya? (laughs) (laughs) Generalizing culture. I think like (laughs) oversimplifying. Yeah, we'll go with that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But so, that's a huge age gap. It is a big age but I gap, think but that's very common, right? Very normal. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So his wife is back in Rome while he is abroad. Um, it, it, you know, to his credit, he is transforming. Well, he's transforming the empire. And one of the biggest things that he's doing during this time where um, that leads to her murder is he, th- all the work that he's doing on Christianity. And he is. When you say a, that, he's trying to get people to become Christians? No, he's a philosopher and he okay. is. He's trying to get Christianity to be accepted. And he was exposed okay. to Christianity um, as a young person. Person. He witnessed the persecution of the Christians and later adopted it. Um, he had this sort of awakening and um, and wants it to be, you know, widely accepted in in the empire. And then, of course, wants people to to convert and wants it yeah. to be the official religion of the yeah. empire. So, but it's it's interesting. You know, it seems like a gradual. Yeah. progression for him to to that point and maybe it's because he couldn't you know like politically or whatever do that earlier but um so his wife fausta uh she is really interesting so let us start by talking about a, an important question which is what do the sources say about right. her yeah. about her death so um there's an anonymous author 
who uh, wrote, But when Constantine had obtained control of the whole Roman Empire by means of his wondrous success in battle, he ordered his son Crispus to be put to death and suggestion of his wife Fausta, so they say. Then he killed his wife Fausta by hurling her into boiling baths. Oh my God. When his mother Helena rebuked him with excessive grief for her grandson. So this source basically suggests that he kills his son and then his mother helena comes yep. to him and is like what have you done right yeah and he's like oh my bad and helena somehow gets him to kill his wife right mother-in-law you know anger yeah, like she obviously must be the root cause of this right so there's a lot there that we'll dissect another source photius of constantinople uh wrote in 425, so over a century later, or a century later, Constantine was induced by the fraudulent artifices of his stepmother to put his son Crispus to death, and afterwards, upon detecting her in the act of adultery with one of his cursors, ordered the former to be suffocated in a hot bath. So this one gives us the sense that Fausta convinced him that Crispus assaulted her. Right. And so he should kill his son. So he does. And then he realizes that she lied to him. And so he kills her. Again, in a hot bath. We'll come back to that later because that's just, an like, interesting so detail. I'm curious about hot baths. <laughs> <laughs> um, another one says this is a bishop from gaul he wrote to a friend um, stating no greater power of satiric suggestion was shown by the consul when in a couple of verses he stabbed at the life and family of constantine and put his tooth into them with uh this little bit that he that he includes here who would now want a golden age of Saturn? Ours is a diamond age of Nero's pattern. And so Nero is this like, he's sort of like the worst emperor of, of Rome in okay. history. He's, he's corrupt and, and evil. And so they're, they're sort of trying to suggest that Const, um, Constantine is, is similar to that. Um, and then, Another one, and this is important, this is a pagan historian, and pagans are very eager at this point <laughs> to rip Constantine down because of his adoption Deal. of Christianity, Deal. et cetera, et cetera. And so he um, said the following, without any consideration of natural law, he, Constantine, killed his son Crispus, who, as I have related before, has been considered worthy of the rank of Caesar on suspicion of having an, had intercourse with his stepmother, Fausta. And when Constantine's mother, Helena, was saddened by this atrocity and was inconsolable at the young man's death, Constantine, as if to comfort her, applied a remedy worse than the disease. He ordered a bath to be overheated and shut Fausta up until she was dead. That's such like an aggressive way to murder someone. Yes. Another source says Constantine did kill his wife, Fausta, and rightly so, since she had imitated Phaedra of old and accused his son Crispus of being in love with her and assaulting her by force, just as Phaedra accused Theseus's son, Hippolytus. And so, according to the laws of nature, as a father, he punished his son, but later he learned the truth and killed her as well, exacting the most righteous penalty against her. So this person thinks that she's, you know, scum and yeah. and writes accordingly. It is beyond me how many sources there are from 307. <laughs> right. I know this one is from this one, one is written later. Uh, this is a Greek historian writing in the 12th century. And this is okay. the last one we'll get into. He says his Crispus's stepmother, Fausta, was madly in love with him, but did not easily get him to go along. She then announced to his father that he, Crispus, loved her and had often attempted to do violence to her. Therefore, Crispus was condemned to death by his father, who believed his wife. But when the emperor later recognized the truth, he punished his wife, too, because of her licentiousness and the death of his son. Fausta was placed in an overheated bath and there found a violent end to her life. So what's interesting is that these sources pretty much agree that 
there was some sort of romantic affair between yep. these two people. Um, they pretty much agree that uh, sh- of where she died in yeah, a bath. And, and who went first. And who went first. Crispus first, then her. Um, but they do not necessarily agree on who seduced whom. Right, like uh, what the true story was. Yeah, like did he rape her? Was she a seductress and couldn't get him was she doing this you know what 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 are what are the what are like the like my mind goes to this is a queen who has bore children of this king this is the one person in the way of my own children's yeah potential like coming to the throne and that's one of the rumors that's like, like that's where my mind goes of I, whenever i think about like kings queens battle this and that it's always about holding the the throne and your next child is that is that person and so i i don't know that's where my mind goes immediately i'm like crispus who in my mind is a character from the rice crispy box (laughs) is one of the keebler elves is now killed in hot boiling water yeah because so multiple reasons that his father didn't end up believing right so this is just interesting and and people have gotten into this this dialogue. Um people are reluctant in recent years to accept sexual scandal. Um there's a lot of people that are saying no no no, she wouldn't have done that. Da 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 da. da. And um what wouldn't you do to keep power? To right, to keep power. So that's an interesting question. And also like or you know her spouse he's he's across the empire so that um, and he whatever it means he put his first wife out of favor right where is she yeah keeping <laughs> favor right some people have said that you know to to the to the idea of let's get her sons in line right and right. protect that um you know people have talked about constantine himself was not a legitimate um child oh, was he and bore so by she-wolves too? <laughs> no <laughs> um and so he would not really have been um and i think this is a a common thing that that people oversimplify history um and and say like oh well you know they were illegitimate so they had to do x y and z you know when you are emperor of the emp- uh, you know of, a, of an empire you can legitimize a child if you want to i mean you write the laws <laughs> right like you just do that and, <laughs> and so, then anyone who's against it you uh, put them in what uh, boiling water so that would not have been a, a bar <laughs> what are the choices <laughs> to succession exactly exactly so um so th- this is kind of um so it doesn't it doesn't explain why Fausta would also be executed too. Like if it if it's just about succession, why does Fausta take the blame here? What's right. what's the problem? Um Who is the new alliance? <laughs> right, right, yeah. Like, like that's now where my mind is. Who's next in line for him to marry that he had to get rid of her? Right. And I don't believe he does. He does not remarry. Right. So um so that just sort of complicates complicates the story. Oh, single father. <laughs> <laughs> have five children well, five, well uh, we know about <laughs> five legitimate children <laughs> um so people are reluctant to accept that and i tend to look at what the sources are saying and assume that there is a grain of truth in those sources you have to you have to go there in your mind because there's enough overlapping similarities that from varying, varying sources, sources yeah. pagans to to Romans to, you know. The accounts are available to dissect and determine. Right. So then we get into how these two are killed. So Crispus, we know, is poisoned. And this is not a typical execution for an nope. adulterer. Poison? From from my murder podcast episodes, yeah, is a very intimate way to kill someone because you don't want them to suffer, right? So you poison them because you're close with them and you can get close to them. So it's typically someone who's known to the the murdery, and um, there's a, usually a loving affection to that person. Yeah, so it would make sense that a father would poison a son. So he is sent off into exile, 
And there are other people in this time period who have been exiled. Mm -hmm. And the emperor later changes his mind and has that person executed. And so Christmas is sent off into exile, knowing that very recent history. Yeah, this could happen. To and me. how long am I actually living in exile? And so some people think that he actually poisoned himself. Oh. Like just to committed suicide to get it over with. And I don't know. I don't live in that camp. Give me some, <laughs> give me some theories. <laughs> well, so yeah, I mean, it's it's all speculation essentially. Yeah. Um, a, now, a Faustus, future king, poisons himself. Well, he he would not be right. There are yeah. other le legitimate sons, and at this point, given these accusations and yeah, the scandal, it would be very he, hard. He's come not back. that that, that, that ship hath, hath sailed, son. <laughs> so. Why is Fausta killed in a bath? This is not a common form of execution. No, this isn't the stereotype. That's not the way it's done. Do it to your women, right? Um, it is. It is very irregular, and like I said, um, execution, like beheading, is is more common for adulterers. And well, that's very public. Someone else has to do it. You got to plan a whole day around it. You got to set up a guillotine. Take mm -hmm. some time. Water readily available in local tubs. <laughs> yes. And it's really fascinating that so many of the sources, like all of the sources mentioned in a bath, right? Yeah, like everyone was like, nope, that's that. That's where that's it happened. Accurate. So questions then arise. Was this possibly an accident it, that occurred yeah, in the bath? and suicide after her lover has been exiled from the community. So she's locked herself in the bath and she is trying to, you know, like process and – Yep. And, yeah. Um, and the sources that are critical of Constantine, you know, murder, murder, you know, like he, sure. he has done that. And, and maybe that's not actually what happened. Um. Many people, many historians have said, well, we just can't know. Now, I found another historian, Lame. and his name's <laughs> David Woods. And okay. in the late 90s, he wrote a piece called On the Death of Empress Fausta. Oh. And he does a deep dive analysis into, okay. into this case because he's fascinated by the whole bath thing because it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't. And... This changed the face of an empire. So yes. why shouldn't we know as much as possible about this? Right. Well, and that's another thing is like other than these things, that's it. Oh, really? She, her name is Zero. like gone in history. So like details about out, her. Out with the bathwater, if you will. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> that was <laughs> too soon. Too soon. Harsh, um, harsh. She's gone. She's gone. And so – he erases her memory from from that point forward. Interesting. She is gone. So this is big. Whatever's there, but it's covered up. Okay. And so what what it's sort of like everybody is repeating this official narrative. She was murdered in a bath, moving on. Next. Yeah, like it's very systematic. Yeah. And it's it's too it's too, too simple like that yeah so we know that she suffocated to death in the bath that's given in the sources it could be that it was too hot some people say that she burned in the boiling water there are examples of uh, stories from this period of people boiling to death in these bathhouses that that this people is a common occurrence. so it happened but one of the things that's interesting that he talks about in this piece on the death of empress fausta is that typically it was lower class basically servants that are you know sort of behind the scenes preparing the water and they're the ones I that mean, are dying makes, not makes the sense. elite royalty I mean, you don't dip your toe in the water yourself. You have your servant do it. <laughs> right. And they're not the ones doing the mixing, right? They're not the ones dealing with the um, dealing with the boiling, scalding water, right? They're, they're dealing with the water after it's already been mixed with cooler water and, and it's <laughs> safe to, to be in. 
Some historians think that her being confined into this bathhouse was part of a, tr- like a... A ruse? No, part of like a uh, getting information out of her about what oh, happened. Like We're going to lock you in here in an interrogation. We are going to interrogate you. We're going to find out what happened between you and Crispus. Right. And we're going to like dig into this, okay? And so she's on the other side of the wall, like, please let me out. You know, like whatever. And and something goes awry. Or maybe she doesn't answer questions right and then she's, you know, overheated or whatever. Okay. And that could be possible. But this doesn't, it doesn't feel like a deliberate, this is not the way that people in the empire are traditionally killed or tortured or treated. And, um, and, I mean, the closest thing is what was common in this time was suffocating people over a slow fire. That was a way to kill sounds somebody. Horrible. It sounds horrible. I know. Some of the other ones are beheading, burning at the stake, and dismemberment. Not that those are better. I mean, there's no category of good here, but sure, I'm with you. That is a little – it is bizarre to have a one-off scenario that doesn't align with others that are of similar circumstance. Like, if you have – proof that other women who have created adultery or committed yeah. committed adultery um are beheaded and that's a systematic approach yeah of the time that would be what you would consider appropriate i guess so this guy's convinced that she committed suicide or was oh. compelled to commit suicide okay and that is really interesting because then why? Well, that is it because she is distraught because Crispus has died. Is it because she's distraught because her reputation is ruined? Is it because right? And what is what's going on? Well, here's there? a thought back to you: is if she is a disciple of Christianity, suicide is a huge no no. So if that gets out. That is falling an empire even further, you know. So maybe that's one of the things too. It's like, no, no, we're all going to say the same consistent thing because if it's suicide, we have a real problem on our hands. Right. One interesting thing about this time period is that we do have some pretty compelling medical pieces that are being written about abortions. Oh. And tell me more. So, one second century physician, Soranus, he studied at Alexandria and practiced in Rome. He wrote um, a piece called Gynecology. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Welcome to the show. So, he um, discusses various methods of contraception and abortion at some length. And so, this is what he says. For a woman who intends to have an abortion, it is necessary for two or three days beforehand to take protracted baths, little food, and to use softening vaginal suppositories. But if a woman reacts unfavorably to venesection and is languid, one must first relax the parts by meaning of sitz baths, full baths, softening vaginal suppositories. And she who intends to apply these things should be bathed beforehand or made to relax by six baths. And if after some time she brings forth nothing, she should again be relaxed by a sitz bath. And for the second time, a suppository should be applied. Wait, what year was that written? This is written in the second century. I mean, what? (laughs) Yeah, it's wild. This is out there. This is in the universe available to women for that long yeah i mean yeah i know there He's, are so many things falling around me that are not appropriate right but i mean so basically one of the ways that you can induce what he's saying one of the ways that you can induce an abortion is sitting in a bath and applying these things and and you have to er, earlier in the piece it sounds like douching essentially is what they're doing with hot water yeah and uh, the theory is and uh, there's a little 
you know, he talks about the, the, it's a little off in in, in some of uh, well, some, I imagine translation is tough. There. Yeah. So one of the things he says in here is is this is for earlier, um, and so in, in in a pregnancy. Yeah. So like as soon as you think you're pregnant, you start doing these things. Yeah. So Woods takes this piece. This this is known medical information that w- the empress would absolutely have had access to women in elite women in rome are highly educated and I mean, well I feel read like this guy was the inventor of ivf like, this <laughs> so with that information it helps to explain the big question of why a bath if she is trying to have an abortion okay. from a child that she has had yeah. with Crispus that would also condemn her. Yep. Makes sense. I'm she in. can at first say, he raped me and whatever. You get sent to exile. Okay. Done. But now she has this physical right. being. D- was it in this time period that only children were made of love? <laughs> no. Just, just trying to wrap my mind around <laughs> no. the treachery of No, so this like, oh my gosh, you were raped. Like, no. You had a baby? Right. Well, yeah. So um no no no. <laughs> just checking. So if she's having an abortion, this really changes the story because it could be that it could mean several things. It could be that she's trying to cover up this affair with an abortion. It could be that she's trying to get rid of a product of rape. Mm-hmm. It could be that I mean. it is a child that is loved and wanted, and Constantine has forced her, like they are saying, he locked her in a bath and to told her to get rid of it, and she ended up dying in the process. Can you imagine how clean this generation of people is? If, like, everyone's like, oh, we just had sex. Bath. <laughs> They're not clean, I will tell you that. Not up to our standards. <laughs> just, I mean, this just seems like a lot of bathhouses. For the elite. For the elite. feel like contraceptive equals bath in this time period. <laughs> So he concludes that she has committed he he believes um David Woods believes that she has committed suicide in a bath while uh, the product of an abortion. Okay. And and that's why it happened in a bath. And it ans- that theory at least answers a lot of the weird questions I'm about good. about her death. But he goes further than I think he should, which is to say that Constantine should therefore be admonished of all responsibility (laughs) and role. And that's where I say, I don't think so. Because when you go back to those sources in the beginning, they say (laughs) he ordered his son put to death and his wife Fausta. Um, They, you know, another one goes so far as to say he did kill his wife. He murdered his wife, right? And that has been the accepted story gone down in history. And and I'm all for changing the story so long as there's evidence. (laughs) This doesn't sound that way. And it doesn't seem, I mean, the sources that we read um, don't, don't seem to suggest that. So... I more buy the version of the story that he locks her in the bathhouse and compels her to try to abort this baby. Yeah. And she dies in the process. Makes sense. Um, and that explains both the manner and the location of her death. Okay. And so this woman in history. Yeah. She's been erased. She's erased. Um, why do you feel like we should be hearing about her? Well, Because figures like, first of all, I think that figures like Constantine need to be viewed in the full picture of who they are. Because students need to understand that figures may accomplish really great things, but also be complicated. And that allows us as 
human. Uh, human people looking at history to be human people and to make mistakes and that the, those I mean murder is, is a big one but it allows our students to register that these these figures are, are are yeah and they they have made errors and let's learn from them um it also brings in to the history of this period talking about Christianity some really complicated questions yeah. about um, life, death, abortion, relationships, marriage. And I'm a huge proponent, obviously, of like a social history yeah. and helping people see what society is like in these eras. And when it comes to women's history in this time period, it is very difficult to get women's stories, especially common women's stories. Yeah. And so we really have to rely on the stories of these elite women like her. Um, and there are several other Roman um, empresses that are worth investigating. There's um, a series of women called the Julias who are interesting because they are sisters and wives and mothers of emperors of Rome. And they, in and during this period, period of decline in mm -hmm. Roman history and they are you know positioning and trying to keep the empire together and essentially are leading Rome and they are really interesting people um because it they show that women have agency in right. this time period and are invested in the success of the empire right and in Fausta's case, I think it oversimplifies her story to, well, first of all, <laughs> most history books, if they mentioned it, just say something to the effect of, and he murdered his son and his wife. Next. And and it's like, all, everyone should be going, what? Wait, pause? Yeah. Back it does, does that like, huh? <laughs> like the little dog ears? Yeah. Up, like, wait. Do we need to know about this? And I heard a really interesting uh, thing from a colleague recently who was saying that, like, you need, you know, we we're talking about centralizing the stories of diverse people. And sure. she said, you know, and, and she said basically, uh, you know, it's not about, cent and it, she was talking back to a white man and she was saying it's not centralizing them for the sake of centralizing them. It's understanding that for your students, they have always been central. Yeah. And for me, when I was a student of history, the women that I learned about in history might have been a footnote, but they were the center of the story in my memory because- right they stood out to me and they were the pieces that I remember. And so when I read he murdered his wife, I go, whoop, question mark. And you might, you know, the, the other yeah. white males or Roman males might not have questioned that. Yeah, but sounds good. Move on. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, she's central to this story. Yeah. So, um, so I think that's a, that's a huge piece, but to oversimplify the story and say that he just murdered her. Well, why and under what conditions and where and, yeah. And how? What did she do during this time? What agency did she have? And yeah, what social contracts were stuck in place that that was possible? Yeah, and happened, and that the the world kept moving. Right. So, I just think this is a really fascinating story, and knowing that Constantine is definitely taught in schools. Yeah. It's a really easy way to bring a little bit of women's history in and question mm -hmm. the character of this man who is credited with so much yeah. uh, during this time. So right. I think he's fascinating. So let us, and I think her story is fascinating. Fascinating. I mean, so much here. So let us take a short break and I will tell you about our second murdering and murdered person in history. Okay. The Remedial History Project is a nonprofit working to get women's history into the K-12 curriculum. Our goal is to create free learning materials for educators to use tomorrow. Head over to our website, www.remedialhistory.com. Download everything and give it to a friend. We need women's history in the classroom like yesterday. If you're not a history teacher and you want to do something to help us out, head over to our store. We've got all sorts of fun things for you to peruse, and all of that goes to supporting our mission. If you think what we're doing is needed, you can support the Remedial History Project 
by becoming a sponsor through Anchor or becoming a patron. Patrons get access to behind the scenes materials, gear, bonus episodes, and more. Most importantly, they're putting their money where their mouth is and helping us get women's history into the classroom. Our history maker, Jeffrey. Our history heroes, Christian, Brooke, and Barbara. Our historians, Jamie, Kent, Jenna, and Nancy. And our history allies, Nicole, Mark, Sarah, Leah, Anne, and Alicia. Thank you so much. You all make this show possible. All right, Brooke, welcome back. Mm -hmm. We are going to cross the globe and head to Sri Lanka. Okay. And talk about a queen from Sri Lanka named Anula. Mm. And she is reportedly the first monarch, female monarch of all of Asia. Wow. So that's pretty interesting. And so we're backing up a little bit in time here um, to the first century. Um, and sh- the kingdom that's emerging in Sri Lanka is a lot of the history of it is built into legends. And okay. so it is around this time, around her time, that the first bits of history are actually being you know, recorded. recorded academically, okay. um, by, you know, by historians in, uh, of this, of this kingdom. And it's a rich kingdom with a massive, um, you know, central city. Um, apparently in most of its history, the, the city was only sacked four times. So it, it, has served you know it was powerfully placed and designed to Mm -hmm. to not be something that could you know easily Easily. be um taken so it's it's a it's a powerful place and um so i think she's important in a history class to talk about the first you know this is the first woman in recorded history who has has been a monarch in asia um on a pretty important point along the sea trading networks um and you know in my his world history classes we spend a lot of time emphasizing the different trading networks and so to have control to understanding how the world evolved right so to to have to have a woman at the helm of one of these you know it really important pieces along that network um is is really interesting so i also feel like you're going to love her because she is evil conniving (laughs) but also like does not she is a woman on a mission and if you're standing in her way like you're dead so to be a first monarch in that time as a woman gotta gotta hold something you gotta be pretty pretty badass so she um she comes to power as a consort meaning she's like the wife of the the ruler okay and he is pretty ineffective um and the historian who wrote about both of them doesn't really like either of them to be fair (laughs) but definitely did not like him Okay. And so she is his consort and uh, he reigned for about 12 years and he is a fool by by all accounts. Um, And so she poisons him. Okay. And so (laughs) she sort of uh, comes to power. Um, She that's that that moment right there. Yeah. Poisoned the ruler. Right. And she gets the lead? Yes. So when in history has that happened? Fascinating, right? Uh, She apparently, according to the main historian, says that she poisoned him because she was enamored with one of the palace guards. So she doesn't actually come to power. It is his son that comes to power. And so she also has his son poisoned. And um, so after the son, she gets the palace guard to be the official like head of state. And so one of the things that I think is a pattern in history that girls should understand, people should learn about, is that women have kept power by manipulating the men in pa- in official titles. Do you mean being smarter? <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I think that this is something that 
even though it's you might strategy. not be queen, uh, you might appreciate that, which yeah. is you they're playing the game, pl- staying in their role, staying in their lane, but she's getting the men into power that are going to do the things that she wants them to do. So she takes the king out, then she takes out his son also by poison, right? This gets to what you were saying earlier about that like intimate. It's very intimate. You have to be close to them. You have to know them. Yeah, you have to be in. Mm -hmm. The queen eventually finds another lover, a carpenter. And this is also a really interesting part of her story is that she is the queen, but a lot of her lovers are palace guards and carpenters. I mean, accessible within her trust line. (laughs) But like way below. Yeah, cannot take her power. Right, way below her her status. Um, She falls in love with a wood carrier and so I she that has that job. That sounds lovely. Just carry, right? carry the wood. Sleep Would you want to do that actually all day? Sleep with the queen, carry the wood. <laughs> Maybe. Sounds lovely. Go on. <laughs> so as she's having all of these affairs, she keeps passing the line, the rule to these people that she is poisoning and bringing into place. Okay. And so this is fascinating that a woman gets away with this so many times along the you have journey. To imagine she has some pretty good loyal guards and people that would die for her if anyone came for her throat. Like you don't stay in power if no one likes you. Right. I know. So – The problem is, and her fatal mistake is, she eventually decides to rule outright, to stop playing this game and to just rule. How dare she? And that is problematic for her. (laughs) They're like, take your carpenters and your tool shed boy, but you may not rule. Right. (laughs) She was deposed by the son of one of the other elites. Mm -hmm. And... Because of that, you know, he basically is able to, to because of his position, he's able to have a legitimate claim to the throne and have her removed. And, you know, given that this is a first in Asian history and, you know, sort of her reckless reign of terror on these, these elite men, um, she is, uh, she's de- deposed pretty easily. Um, he returns with an army, seizes the throne from her, and um, he apparently burned her in her palace. Whoa! To death. Um, so That's there's like a couple a different final note, right? Well, there's a couple different interpretations. Um, either she was slain and then her body was burned on a funeral pyre, pyre or that she was burned alive in the palace. In either case, uh, she is no longer the king, and the next king rules for 32 years oh, after wow. her. Okay. So um, her story is really fascinating. One of the interesting historical questions is, is she, you know, how, what do you do with this legacy? Right. Is this the story of a woman trying to keep power in a system that doesn't have room for her? Or is she just like this crazy seductress lady who has lots of romantic lovers and, and, then conversely, does history judge her because she is a woman who has had lovers? Would those same – would we right. be talking about her affairs with men if she was male, right? Would this would this dialogue even exist? So unfortunately, there's really only one source for her life. And that is always frustrating in history yeah. because you don't get to really – look at how different people interpreted their story and try to find some common narrow focus or you know like when we have pagans that are talking about constantine we know that they're going to be critical so like that helps us read what they're saying from the historian that he didn't like either her or or the former leader right so does he not like her because she's a woman in this position right like did she well, think about bad press. <laughs> it's just like right. that's who's covering it. That's going to be their opinion. It's an opinion piece, right? And so, one, you know, the chronicler, this historian who who tells her tale, he doesn't like her. And in a lot of ways, histories of this time period are really like morality stories. And so, one question that 
you could ask about this is, you know, is this really just a story about how women shouldn't be allowed to rule? Those stories happen over and over again in history, right? This is like, this is what happens, right? Oh my God, you guys should see Kelsey's face. Yeah. Yeah. I see it. I'm over I it. See it. Okay. Over. If there was an over it face, you just made it. <laughs> um, the way that he tells the story, it makes it seem like her choices of lovers are erratic reckless yeah random and when you heard it you went oh but this is a person below her who's not going to challenge her power right you yeah. you sort of read it differently and so you know could this also be a story for understanding how women operated when they in, yeah. in her case it sounds like she was operating on bo borrowed time right right she was like who can i just keep around here to make this work right and to keep power, right? right. How do like, I do that? It's all about strategy. She's not going to win over anything really in that time period because she is a woman. So what can she win over? And those small wins can amount to ruling longer. The one thing that's really hard when you have a chronicler that hates you <laughs> is that they don't tend to talk about your accomplishments. Yeah, yeah. And it's one of the things that happens over and over to women in history is a lot of times their like personal sexual dramas get told, yep. but not the like pr you know the policies of their administration and so what does that tell us does this tell us that those women didn't have policies right. or does this just reflect the the historians writing about them and the people from their period one thing that i think is really cool about her and other queens is that this is such a cool conversation to have with kids about either this region of the world that you're right. learning about, um, about the role of gender and sexuality and female leadership and how that was yep. seen and perceived, how women had power, kept power, you name it, talk about it, how cool. And so I, I just, I think that's really valuable to get into with students. And what's really cool is that there are so many queens in history from all over the world yeah. that we know about and have sources about that you that you know this could be a student research project it could be like do you know everybody pick a queen research a queen yeah um tell us about that and and then you teach us a little bit about china about north africa about yep. right like these these you know depending on on when when you're talking right like what the empires looked like or, right. you know um but this could be so cool to do with them and use queens as the foundation for understanding no, the culture that. and how they're treated and what they do to keep well, power you, and how they like get power envision this entire board across the room of like all these women and then you're highlighting the consistent things across each one of them like this is what they had to have in order to lead. Da, 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 da. What what themes are you seeing in today's society that are similar? It's right. Like, well, and what are the pa patterns? Right. Right. What are like, all those themes and, and patterns? You know, it's it's interesting because both of these women come to get get power through their families positioning Alliance, them yeah. and aligning them, and then they they get to where they are. You know, Fausta is is consort, but she becomes consort then queen, right? right. In outright. And so, so that's interesting. And she does that through her spouse. And I think of, I can think of so many modern parallels there, right? right? Yeah. Um, I mean, even things like Hillary Clinton comes to mind, right? Like, what is she known for? Well, first, she was a first lady. Right. Second, she was a senator, right? So it's sort of like the, like those things, those patterns still exist. Right. And, and, if you think about in our modern culture, how you would get a woman to the White House, does she have to be married to a former president to get there? Or right. Can she get there independently and outright? Right. Through her own skill, education, and background. Right. Or are these things still systemic and built in so concretely in our foundation that we can't fight back? Right. And – you know, are we continuing, you know, you can, can, you can make all these parallels of like, are we continuing to judge these people and talk about these, these women leaders based on their policies 
and their visions. Right. Or is this about pantsuits? <laughs> right, pantsuits, <laughs> and you know, you know whether or not she slept with the the wood carrier, right? Like one thing when we get into next week's episode as well, which is also about queens, is you'll you'll notice in in those cases as well, their sexuality is also brought up and yeah. and challenged. So it's a very it's a very much a common theme. Um, so Deal. I'm excited to to get into that next week. Me as too. Well. Thanks, Kelsey. So lots. Lots of murder this week. Yeah. Uh, first one, more of a mystery. Second one, m- more of an interesting commentary on on power. Okay. Um, but just two of many stories related to queens that one could tell with students. And these are up on the website? These, so th- I have several things on our website. One is a link to many lists of queens. And then we have lesson plans on monarchs and how to, how to evaluate, like to really look at female monarchs in history. History okay. and how they led and how they got to power. And I think it's Very really cool. a fascinating way to explore some figures in history. And queens are, like I said before, an interesting window into women's yep. history of that time period because you don't have a lot of stories about common women. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Thanks, Kelsey. I'm I'm Brooke Sullivan. I'm Kelsey Eckert. See you next time. Thanks so much for listening to Remedial Her Story, the other 50%. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to your podcasts to bring more voices to the conversation. We really appreciate that effort. Until next time.